Okay. We have a lot of things to do today. So uh, we'll start with the with the part that I, I didn't get a chance to finish in the last uh, in the last lesson about two uh, two techniques. One is for purifying and one is for detecting uh, proteins. So, <coughs> um, actually, the, a lot, most of the time you will not find this uh, technique used so much in articles, and that's why I also um, skipped this. Actually, in the article that I gave you to read, they used this for an uh, initial step, but again, it, I don't think it's relevant to what you need to know as future neuroscientists. So, <coughs> We'll just go over this quickly. So generally, uh, another method for purifying uh, proteins is based on uh, several qualities of, of the protein. And it uses a method that you can uh, uh, refer to as a liquid chromatography or a filtration chromatography. And in this, in this example, we'll, we'll see actually three types. And the first example is gel filtration chromatography, which actually filters um, fragments by their size, okay? But this works, uh, as you say, like in the um, opposite way of a gel. Instead of having like this mesh, you have these small balls that have uh, uh, small like uh, um, pores inside them, and these pores can be designed uh, as the size of the protein that you want to uh, extract or isolate. So what actually happens when you load the proteins here and you just let gravity uh, do its work, then the large proteins that can't fit into these small uh, uh, grooves or uh, pockets inside these uh, beads, and they just keep on going, okay? And the smaller ones, <coughs> and the smaller ones are like held back by the interactions that they form inside these pockets. So what actually happens is that the large molecules pass first, and the small molecules or uh, will pass later. And, by, and if you separate, uh, and I mean in the sense of time, if you first pass a first fraction of liquid, you always, how this works with method is that you drip a constant flow of liquid from the top, and this liquid just washes um, this column continuously. And then you can extract, if you, if you extract the first portion of liquid that comes out, you'll get large proteins, then you get intermediate proteins, and then you get small proteins, okay? Like, and this is a very, yeah? Can you repeat why the smaller ones, they are not? Because of this. You see, this is an enlargement of, of these uh, orbs, or these balls. And these balls are designed in a way that they have these, um, they have these um, pockets inside of them. Okay, you see these? And this is like a small protein. And the small protein interact with these pockets. They, like, fit them. So they actually hold these small proteins back. And uh, because, they, because the larger proteins do not interact with these balls, then they just pass through. Okay, these balls are really relatively large to the proteins, so it's not like they're holding, creating some kind of mesh that interferes with the large protein's movement. Okay? So this is like a size-based uh, chromatography. Um, another method that you can use is <coughs> Uh, ion exchange, okay, you can take, like, if you want to separate a, a protein that's charged, like, positively or negatively, um, then you can have um, these beads that are, in this, in this example, they're positively charged, uh, gel-based beads, and they, attract, uh, and, and they attract the negatively charged uh, molecules. Oh, this actually, this should be the opposite, but never mind. I think it's a mistake. So uh, they attract the molecules that are, that are opposite to them, and thus you see these are negative. This is uh, anyway. So they attract the, the, the opposite charge molecules, and the, uh, and the same charge molecules actually pass through. And in this case, it's not a matter of time, or it's a matter of when you're adding salt. Okay. So adding salt to, to this solution then the small ions of the salt will compete with binding sites on the pores, and they will actually release the proteins that we want to, uh, that we want to purify. Okay, so in the beginning, we, we pass through like a, a solution of water, a buffer, or something like that, and then we'll clean out all the proteins that we don't want, 
which in this case are uh, positively charged. And <coughs> after that, we will uh, we will add salt, which will release, which will compete, which will bind a lot better to these beads and release the proteins that we want that have a specific type of charge. Okay, so this is ion exchange chromatography. And the last one, can you maybe guess? We're talking about like size, charge, and pH. And uh, this is antibody. Actually, are we talking about it? Yeah. No, this is not pH. Okay, maybe I don't have an example of the pH here. Okay, so forget about the pH. So this is antibody uh, based chromatography. And what actually, um, <coughs> what actually has, happens here is that you have these beads that are, have an antibody that's conjugated to them. And this an antibody is specific to a protein that you want to isolate. And when you load the proteins here, obviously, all the proteins that the antibody doesn't recognize, and this is a very, very specific and tight connection between an antibody and its target. So only the proteins that uh, you want to bind are binding to the antibodies, and all the other ones are just washed away. And when, once you think you washed enough of the proteins away, you can add uh, <coughs> a solution that changes the pH um, to normally an acidic pH, and this acidic pH will break uh, will break the bonds between the uh, the antibody and the protein that you want, and you have the protein that you want according to the affinity to to the antibody. Okay, so these are methods, common methods for if you want to purify a specific type of protein according to its properties. And detection, we talked about Western bot, which was in the article. If you want, we can repeat it when we talk about the article. And characterization, again, like they used in the article, they used X-ray crystallography. We talked about it before. The last method that I didn't talk about is uh, that I want to talk about is mass spec, which is a very interesting method because it can also, it's a very exact and robust method, so we can actually uh, identify a large fraction of proteins. So what, what actually, you put your sample here, then you blast this sample uh, with a laser that ionizes the, the proteins that you want to look at. It actually gives them like a charge. And then, because there's an electric field that's applied here, the proteins fly, and, and this time the acceleration, the acceleration of the protein through the medium is proportionate to the size, okay? So this is the MS, uh, the, what is called Malditov, or time of, time of flight uh, mass spec. So according to the time it takes for the layer to, uh, laser to ionize, to the proteins to, the, to reach here, you have the actual size of the protein, okay? And you also can see the amount of the proteins. Like let's say you have a lot of this small protein, you'll see a large peak here. Because smaller proteins, because they're lighter, it will take them, uh, the acceleration will be much faster. And thus they will get to the detection panel a lot faster. Okay? Uh, and also, you, so you have, for example, you can uh, identify proteins. What happens is normally that the, the proteins are not, are not inserted as their like, territory structure, the, the full protein. What you uh, normally do, you break the protein into small pieces. And each protein has a specific like, footprint of the pieces that are formed from this uh, protein. You can identify and also quantify how much of the protein you have according to the plot. Okay? So here, for example, this, uh, this is an example of an antibody that has, if you take this antibody and put it into a liquid, <coughs> in, into this mass spec machine, you get this profile. Like you have a small, um, less of a, like a smaller unit that hits first and then a, a larger unit that hits last, but most of the protein is like an intermediate. And according to this profile in the size uh, of the fragments, you can identify that this is this protein. Okay? And actually, today with modern techniques, you can identify thousands of proteins. Like you can take a sample, blast it, and according to the, to the pattern of the, uh, of the peptides or the proteins that you get, you can identify I had, I don't know, uh, like a thousand units of this protein and two units of this protein and one million units of this protein, okay? Uh, <coughs> so there's a very interesting technique to identify proteins. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, yeah, you can do that. You can actually, some, some people use it to identify um, you, if you have a DNA molecule, a, sh a short DNA molecule, then if you have one substitution of the base for another base, let's say you have a mutation or something like that, then according to the weight, you can identify uh, if one, one uh, molecule will be lighter than the other one. And you can know by the specific weight what type of, uh, uh, <coughs> what type of nucleotide in this case will substitute. Yeah, this is uh, this one. Yeah, if you have like if you have some kind of mutation, a lot of times you'll see it in this uh, profile. The profile will be a little bit uh, shifted. So, uh, but this method is the, uh, if you calibrate it correctly, it can be extremely exact in the in the sense of the weight. It can identify like uh, Dalton variances uh, between molecules, which is very small uh, variances in weight. Okay. So, now we'll talk about the um, Okay, so we'll just go very fast on the questions that you were supposed to uh, go over and for, for the end of this chapter, so we can close this chapter. So, we learned about chaperones. Uh, what are chaperones doing in general? Someone? Yeah? Okay, and in general, what they do is they actually they promote uh, folding, okay, and they promote also a specific type of folding, but um, so will a chaperone can chaperones fold proteins into a shape of which the protein is unable to acquire spontaneously? Normally not. Normally we say that the protein has like this uh, valley of energy, like, a, like I told you before, and the, and the native state is the most stable uh, energetic, energetic form. What the chaperones do is that they catalyze uh, and they make sure that uh, <coughs> um, this folding really occurs. So. The correct answer here is chaperones promote proper folding. Is that clear? Why the other ones are not correct? If you have questions, questions? No? Yeah. Why what? A. And um, so they don't form them into a thermodynamically unstable state. The, the actually, the, the state which, which they fold the proteins normally is the most stable thermo thermodynamical state. Okay, this is like the lowest amount of uh, like free energy. If you remember the the plot that I showed, like like this, so the the native state is the most is the most stable uh, form, and normally the pro the the chaperones help the protein fold faster into this stable form. Um, yeah, we actually we in the I can show you if you want the I showed you like a short short movie. So there, I, we didn't talk about the. It was also in the in the diagram, but the, it it costs ATP. But so so I understand like what you where's the confusion? Because it's like ATP that is not uh, thermodynamically. So when we mean thermodynamically, I don't mean that it's not catalyzed. That this is not. Uh, it can be thermodynamically stable in the terms of entropy. In the like if we were talking about. Um, <coughs> Here, thermodynamically, is, uh, is speaking about the protein itself, not about the enzymes that are... If this, if this process requires external energy or chemical energy, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's like stable or unstable shape. Okay? Okay, so an enzyme active site. Um, can it include a ligand binding site? Yes, a DNA binding site? A binding site for specific proteins? No? A catalytic site? Hydrophobic site? Um, yeah, you're correct. The, actual, the answer is this. And uh, one of the reasons that I put this, in, although I didn't teach it, is, uh, is because 
uh, I like this is generally this is generally true that there are a lot of things that can be in the binding site and if and I, I don't it can DNA binding proteins uh, that uh, as if we learn today about uh, several proteins like this but in general DNA can bind uh, like if you have enzymes that are DNA binding protein or nucleic acid binding protein like you remember that we saw um, the motifs of the protein one of them is binding DNA binding uh, motif like the zinc finger is a DNA binding motif uh, and we'll see examples of that today so all of these are actually could be correct and this is important for the article passing through passing a protein through mixture through a standard SDS polyacrylamide gel and I mean by SDS is a denaturing gel like a uh, uh, like we talked about last class uh, is a technique for protein separation by which feature are the proteins separated huh? but still so no but but what which one of these we don't have all these because if we're talking about it's a specific SDS polyacrylamide gel. We're not talking about homotography. We're talking about a method that's called also Western blot, which is SDS separation by gel. Okay. It's important because we're going to talk about it in the uh, so I'll just show you. This is this method. Okay. So. No, but actually we talked about it before. Um, yeah. Okay, so here. So this is what I talk about when I say SDS polyacrylamide gel. It's this method is called Western blot. Okay, and uh, so you remember we talked about the polyacrylamide that creates this mesh. And what happens, and the SDS itself causes the proteins to linearize and cause, and also makes the charge homogeneous along the molecule. So, is it separated by charge? No, because we're actually adding like charge uh, here. We're, we're canceling the native protein's charge. It's not negligible relative to the SDS. Is it by pH? No, because this is the second method. We could talk about that two-dimensional gel interferences is by pH. So it's actually according to size, right? And smaller molecules will move faster or slower if we apply them to this gel. Faster. Smaller molecules will pass easier through the mesh, uh, through the mesh that the gel is creating. Okay? In this method, liquid chromatography, what we talked about before, it's the opposite. But remember, this method is, is important. You'll see it a lot in, in articles in general. This is the most uh, common. If you want to say that you see a specific protein, you use this method. Okay? And <coughs> this is actually here for the purifying, but the application of this uh, process later for detection is after you run it in a gel, you transfer it to, a, after you run the proteins in a gel, the smaller proteins are here, larger proteins are here, you transfer it to a membrane, and then you expose it to an antibody. So you can have a specific, you can, you want to prove that you have the specific type of the protein that you're looking for. So first of all, you have the antibody, and second of all, you have the size. So you can say, my protein is expected to be 300 kilo Dalton, and really I see a band in the, in the height of the 300 kilo, kilo Dalton, and I have an antibody staining uh, for that. Okay, all the other proteins that you don't uh, attach an antibody to, or in a secondary antibody is to, to see the band, because proteins are, tra are transparent. Okay, so we need to add factors to help us to see them. So all the other proteins, you don't see them. Okay, you see only the specific ones that you design, <coughs> that you target an antibody to. Okay, so. We're done with that. And moving quickly to the article. 
So, how was the article? Okay, so in general, it's not a it's not an article that normally neuroscientists will read. Okay, it has a lot of uh, it's like a, it's it's above uh, it's like lower it's lower level in biology. If you say it, it's like a chemistry article, but it still incorporates questions and techniques that are very important to understand, and very important also to understand general features of articles and art and good articles also like this one. So if you want to get your article published in Nature, you will have to follow these steps, the, the general steps that we're going to talk about. Okay? So some of these questions we'll answer now, some of them we'll answer in the end. <coughs> I also added some. So, first of all, one of the reasons that when, when I start uh, reading about a protein and I don't know anything about it, usually Wikipedia is the best place to look nowadays. You just open NMDA receptor, you read the whole segment, and you're in a good situation to start reading an article about this. So, is NMDA, and I mean the molecule NMDA, not the receptor, is it endogenous? Can you find it in the brain? Correct. Actually, we don't have any NMDA in our system. It's a completely synthetic molecule. And that's also one of the things that you need to understand when you name when you name a protein or name a receptor or something, it doesn't necessarily mean that this name impl implies something about the actual function. It's <coughs> a lot of times, the, the process of the history of the discovery of the protein involves some kind of pharmaceutical agent or something that was, uh, that was made in a lab, and, thus, and, and then after they, know, after they discovered the effect of this drug, they can identify through which mechanism this effect occurs, and then they discover the protein, okay? So, <clears throat> actually, I don't know the, the full history of the NMDA receptor, uh, but I can imagine that this went more or less like that, and that's the name NMDA receptor, but we don't ha actually have NMDA in our, in our body. So what actually, what uh, opens, what, ac what activates NMDA in the body? What molecules? Glutamate right, glutamate and glycin, and in the article they don't, uh, they don't really... Uh, yeah, so this is in, uh, what makes it open. Actually, glutamate is like the main, the main molecule. Glycine is like the secondary molecule. One of the reasons that uh, glycine is like normally there in general. And you need the glutamate, uh, and you need to look... Glutamate is like the one that uh, is, is uh, normally absent if you want to. And <coughs> only comes like from excitatory synapses uh, and specific time. And glycine is normally like more generally there. Okay, but it's right that glycine and glutamate, li like we see here in this model, this is actually the model from the end uh, of the article, but uh, glutamate and glycine are both necessary in order to, for the channel to open. And one of the things they don't talk about here at all is the fact that you have also a, mag a magnesium cap in this NMDA receptor that sits somewhere here, I think. And what do you need to open this magnesium cap? You know? But, but uh, what, what causes the Depolarization. So depolarization of the, now we can say like postsynaptic cell, together with administration of glutamate, will open this channel. And this is one of the reasons that this receptor is really, really important, really interesting for learning and memory. And do you know why? You heard the phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together? Have you heard this before? So you, you didn't? Wow. So I'm really feeling privileged that I'm the first one that, uh, that claimed this, because you will hear a lot about it. This is like a Heb rule, in general, that's like the I think in 1960 or something like that, Donald Hebb uh, first uh, proposed a model for synaptic plasticity. Today we know it's a lot more complex, but in general, if two, two neurons fire together or fire in close proximity after one another, then their synaptic, uh, <coughs> their synapses strengthen and their connection is uh, stronger. And one of the first molecular mechanisms that people found that can, um, that we can, that can cause this phenomenon 
is this receptor because it, it requires uh, it requires glutamate from the presynaptic si uh, site that is here and requires simultaneously uh, depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. So it's like a coincidence detector between if you had a signal that is strong enough and fast enough, then these two components will come together and the channel will open. Okay? So <coughs> is an MDA ionotropic or metabotropic? Do you know this uh, concept? Do you know what it means? Okay, great. <laughs> so it's ionotropic. Ionotropic means that it's a simple channel that once it gets activated, it opens and the, uh, and the ion just passes through. Metabotropic normally involves a second messenger that we will talk about in, uh, also in next classes. Um, most of the time, like a G protein coupled uh, secondary message. So the first initiation doesn't cause a direct effect on the protein itself, but it causes like a, sc a cascade of reactions that then alters, uh, alters like molecular mechanism downstream. Okay, so also the <coughs> the speed is also uh, much different. And what ions enter through an MDA receptor? So generally, it's not one of the most uh, fussy receptors in general, not, not very specific. A lot of ions can pass through this uh, uh, channel when it opens, but it's mainly calcium. Okay? So uh, also the effects that people claim, uh, that people claim for uh, NMDA receptors for uh, LTP and synaptic plasticity are mostly due to the influx of calcium uh, inside the cell. Okay? So you will learn also in, uh, that calcium does everything in the cell. <laughs> Okay? Everywhere that uh, people think that there is a cellular function, there is calcium sticking there somewhere. Okay? Uh, especially like uh, neuronal functions. So here also, if you have calcium entering, then uh, we're not going to talk about the... Maybe we'll talk in next classes. I'll see. But, yeah. Coincidence detector. Yeah, Mm -hmm. So, like, NMDA opens when two neurons fire together, and then it's what causes the, the wiring, or it's just, like, not related. So, you see neurons that do that, you also see NMDA. So, yeah, the, the NMDA is actually, like you said, is a, is a cause of this joint activity. Like, it, 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 it's, not, it's not the one that's causing the joint, sorry, it's not the one that's causing the activity. It's the one that facilitates the entrance of calcium, and thus, uh, activating the cellular pathways that will create LTP, that will create uh, synaptic, that will increase the synaptic strength. So it's a, like a detector; it's not a coincidence causer in that uh, in that sense. Uh, but it does cause the wiring. So the the firing it doesn't, but the wiring it probably does. There are a lot of other mechanisms, well, some of which I will teach you in the in the end of the semester. So that's just one of the mechanisms that facilitates LTP. Okay, so something that's also very important for this uh, uh, coincidence detection is, is it deactivated rapidly or slowly? Like, what is the kinetics of this channel? Slowly. Slowly. And when you say slowly, you mean relative to what? To those that are not uh, NMDA, uh, not react, don't react to NMDA. Right, so in this article they also talked about NMDA and non-MDA. And one of, this, uh, one of the reasons that there's a dramatic difference between the, the, the dynamics of the NMDA receptors and the non-MDA receptors, like glutamate receptors, like simple glutamate receptors, which they, um, they, they reference this protein to the glutamate receptor all the time in the article. So the glutamate uh, receptor, I actually answered the question, but never mind, uh, it's much faster. Okay, and the NMDA receptor can get to a... Uh, the deactivation, like once the protein is, <coughs> once the channel is opened, so the deactivation takes 
a long time. In general, like in, in, in channel terms, this is like some channels that take microseconds to open and close, and, some, and uh, this channel is, can be in the order of seconds. Okay? So it can be like five or four orders of magnitude slower than other channels. Okay? <coughs> and uh, is NMDA heteromeric or homomeric? Again, what does it mean? If we say homomeric or heteromeric? Okay, um, so is it uh, heteromeric or homomeric? It's heteromeric, right. The two components here are, uh, <coughs> the two components that we talked about that, uh, that are joined together, or the active component, uh, the one also that they crystallized uh, here, are two different units. One is NR1 and NR2A, okay? Obligate heteromer? The you mean in the article and the I don't want to get into that. I, I, I will not talk about that experiment specifically in the article that they did also the chromatography and they tried to see the demerization and the uh, uh, because I don't think it's very um, relevant to what we are talking about in general. Okay, so and what is the research question? What is the purpose? of this article. <laughs> you know? No? They wanted to characterize this this channel. Yeah, so in general you're right. The the objective of this article was to get to get the structure, the molecular structure of this protein, uh, <coughs> and to, and through this molecular structure, understand the function. As you will see, that's one of the reasons that this article got to nature is that you can also gain a lot of insights of the function of this receptor through the through the structure. So, what exactly did they, what did they crystallize? Did they crystallize the whole, this whole thing? Um, yeah, but generally the, their aim, I think in the beginning, a lot of times there's a difference between the aim that they say the aim was and the actual aim. Before this, you didn't have a crystal, you didn't have a crystal structure of this protein, okay, before this article about that, and also specifically, that's the question I, I said before, they didn't crystallize the whole channel, they crystallized only, um, as you can see here, these cut things are like showing how they prepared, actually they prepared from the large protein the units that they want uh, to crystallize. And um, so I, this, this is like the main goal is to understand, uh, to understand the structure, but understanding the structure, then what do you do with it, right? So they wanted to understand the structure in comparison to the uh, glutamate receptor and see the differences. And also, they claim that this was their goal because this is what they found. Okay. So, uh, so in general, I, I would guess that if they would find something else, the title would be a little bit different. Okay. Okay. So we talked about this. The other question we'll talk about later. Just, uh, just in general. So, do you understand this uh, scheme that they uh, that they drew here? Like how they did this. Uh, how they did this, uh, what does this represent? Because they didn't actually crystallize the whole protein, without, so they took without these elements and without these elements, and they crystallized also like one of the elements, and then they crystallized <coughs> the NR1 together with the NR2A, okay, that are like joined together. So that's uh, the most important result is the crystallography of these two components together. And that, as I told you like in the previous, uh, in the previous class, the most difficult thing to do is to, to create this crystal. This is like the, so a lot of times it's very hard to achieve a crystal uh, for a protein, for several proteins, and especially hard 
if you're trying to take two subunits that are not covalently linked to one another and, uh, and uh, crystallize them, okay? So one of the, the next thing I do after I, read, after I read Wikipedia is that I go to the, there's a segment called editor summary. If it's an important article, normally the editor will have something to say about the relevance of this article. So, and this also gives you an understanding of what you want to, what you want to look for in the article and the gain of this article. So, uh, apart from the blah, 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 okay? So, now, you, you start from this. I mean, you don't have to read this because this is from Wikipedia. Um, high, the high-resolution crystal structure of glycine and glutamate binding domains of the NR1 and NR2A heterodimer, and the NR2A subunit bound to glutamate. Okay, so the structure confirms the heterodimer as the basic functional unit of the NMDA receptor. So you see the editor, it, he actually claims that like, the goal of this article is uh, just a crystallography. It doesn't talk about the, uh, like the glutamate receptor at all that they talk about. So also for the editor, this, this importance is the high resolution crystal structure of this, uh, of this uh, protein. And it's funny that it says high resolution because high resolution indicates that you can have a higher resolution, but there's no higher resolution. <laughs> like they know, if, you, if they know the atomic conformation of all the items there, so what else does he want, this guy, you know? It's like an ultimate resolution. Okay, so what did, they actually, what did they actually find? What's the purpose? What is this figure? What does this tell us? Okay. 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 So, someone else. Do you know what what is the what do you want to show here? What are they showing? Like this is like the first figure. Oh. Right. So the first thing that you want to show is that the interaction between the two. You, you know that there are two separate proteins, the NR1 and NR2A are both encoded, we'll talk about it, like from different genes and uh, they're separate proteins and they just interact together to form the channel, okay? To form the upper part or the extracell extracellular part of the, uh, of the channel as you can see here. And what they want to know is what are the interactions that hold this structure together? So they identify like three sites, site one, site two, and site three. And it doesn't really matter, I don't want to get, they also describe exactly the interaction between each amino acid and stuff like that, but I don't want to get into that. What's important is that the type of connection that they find here, which is, uh, they find hydrophobic uh, connection between uh, different residues of, uh, of alpha helixes. They, found, they find the salt bridges, what you would call, but we term it like electrostatical interactions between negatively and positively charged <coughs> Um, um, uh, amino acids, residues, and they find also hydrogen bonds, okay, that, that hold the structure together. So this segment is like a report. Okay, we have the crystallography. This is how these two, two units connect to one another. How we find that these two units connect to one another. And then, a lot of times also in crystallography, they want to compare it the next, the ne what's the next step? Like they did the crystallography, they showed you the structure that they, that they crystallized. What, what are they trying to do here? What's, what's important? Like, did they convince you? Like, if, you, if you're coming from outside and you're not from the field, then you say, okay, you crystallized it, great. Great job, <laughs> okay? But actually, what, what you, you want, want is proof, right? You say that this is a structure, but we want to show, well, we want to see like evidence that this is a structure. So one of the things that they do is that they compare it to, to channels that are, or structures that are already known, and <coughs> already known and proven, and they know that should, similar, uh, should be similar to what they, more or less, to, to what they got. So along, all along this article, they compare to the <coughs> GLUR2 a glutamate uh, receptor, a unit of the glutamate receptor. And this is what you can see here in pink, okay? And 
One of the things that they talk about is that they divide it into two domains. Again, this is totally arbitrary, okay? Uh, the division, this division like here. Here you have like one domain and then you have the second domain. So do you remember what they say about the first domain and the second domain? What can you see from this, from this image? What can you learn from the comparison between the, uh, of these two units to the molecule that needs to be similar to this, unit, to this molecule? Uh, right, but, uh, but, more, but uh, structurally simpler, si more simply, is that here there's more or less a good overlap, you see, between the structures. Like the pink is overlapping really nicely with the green and the blue. But over here, you have these things and these things and the movement of the linkers are where, where this molecule is attached to the, <coughs> to the membrane bound uh, part uh, of the protein. So you, you see there are these large shifts in the structure. So here it's similar, but here it's different, okay, in general. Again, it's pretty much, it's pretty much similar, but the overlap is not very good. And again, in, they have this language of crystallographers and protein structurists that I, I don't speak, that they like, can quantify how much these two, uh, these two structures are similar to one another. Okay, questions? Okay. Yeah? So, as I told you before, they want to... Their, their aim is to show us here that Okay, we, we, we should have seen a, a structure that's similar, so we actually see a structure that's similar, and it's similar here, but it's a little bit different uh, here. So what's the, in, in, that, in that in mind, what are they doing in this figure? What are they doing, what is their objective here? Okay, so you're right, and more, and more than that, so like I told you before, did they crystallize the whole protein in the natural, you know, uh, natural environment, natural pH, natural conditions, membrane bound, everything? No, they just took the two, uh, the two structures that are uh, <coughs> like we saw before. So one of the most important things to prove that this is indeed the structure is after they said, okay, so we did the crystallography right, now let's see if this is actually the structure. Like maybe because of the crystallography, because of the procedure, we somehow distorted uh, the structure uh, of, of what we got. And we, we need to see if this is actually what happens in real life or in a cell, in a live cell. Okay, so what did they do in order to prove that? Okay, so they actually changed four amino acids, two in one, two in this protein, and two in this protein. They changed it to an amino acid called cysteine, and what's special about cysteine, you see, it's one of the special amino acids, like I told you in the first lesson, it's the one that causes the curliness in your hair, because it forms, it can spontaneously in, uh, form this sulfid bridge, or this covalent bond between two cysteine, and what they actually hypothesize is they say, okay, let's take, uh, if we take one amino acid that according to our structure is close to this amino acid in the second structure and we swap them to cysteine, then if they're really, in, in real life, if, they're, if the two of them are really adjacent to one another or close to one another, they will form a disulfid bridge. Okay, they will form a covalent link uh, between them that was not there uh, <coughs> originally and they did this in two places. Yeah, so let's say you have a, you hypothesize, you hypothesize that your uh, protein looks like this, like you have uh, uh, something sticking out here, doesn't matter, okay? Like, and as you see, the structure is very, very complex in general, like the folding, everything, and if you claim that this structure is true, then a very nice manipulation that you can do is you can take the amino acid from here, okay, and the amino acid from here, and swap it 
with, uh, with two amino acids, the same ones, actually cysteine, that what they can do, they can form a link between them. If they're close enough to one another, very close actually, they will form a link, uh, they will form a, a covalent link between, uh, 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 between the two amino acids and they will form a disulfide bridge. This, this special bond that's called a disulfide bridge. And <coughs> if this bridge will, and if you, if, if you have proven that this bridge was formed, then it means that your model was right. Because if your model is wrong, and this amino acid, because the only thing that they know is that, that this amino acid is like uh, 773, okay? So when they, look at the, when they look at the gene of the protein, then they will have to mutate the location where amino acid 773 uh, will be and change it from one amino acid, uh, change the codon, I saw you learned in the previous, change the codon from one amino acid to a second amino acid. Okay, so let's say their hypothesis is wrong, and amino acid 773 is not actually here, but it's here. Then they will they will not have this disulfide bridge. Because they they make this hypothesis based on the crystal structure, okay, and they test it in bio, in a biological model. They test it in a real life biological model. So if the same so if in the biological model this will hold, then it means that their crystal structure is relevant for the biological uh, protein uh, the whole, the full biological protein. Okay, so we'll take a break and we'll continue next class.
So, it looks like you're all rested. You look refreshed. And okay, so we. I hope you understand now, like what is the logic behind the manipulation that they did here. And now, how do they show that this link actually occurred? Okay, so this is actually what you have here, and this method is what. Hint, we talked about it today, and it's not chromatography. <laughs> yeah, this this method is Western dot or SDS polyacrylamide uh, electrophoresis, and it's like long. Uh, um <coughs> So, actually, what, what, how do they do this uh, protocol? So they take, they extract proteins, they extract specific proteins. First of all, the experimental construct, what did they do? Like, how did they, where did they express this protein? Like the, do you know? Like, is it like uh, an in vitro model? Did they do it like in a, a vial? What, did they do it in cells? Did they do it in a mouse? Did they do it? Well, uh, not exactly, but they did it in a, a Xenopus oocyte or a frog oocyte, like a <coughs> which it, which in general uh, a lot of uh, electrophysiologists um, like to do uh, like to do manipulation in this kind of cell because it's a huge cell, okay, and you can express a specific construct uh, inside the cell and you can record from them very easily uh, later on and uh, stuff like that. But in this case. Um, before we get to the electrophysiology, they expressed the full uh, the full protein. Okay, like all the subunits, everything together. The only difference was that they altered this. They did what they call a double mutant. So one mutant in, is in a, uh, the two mutations in the NR1 gene and two mutations in the NR2A gene. Okay, that's the only difference from the wild type uh, protein. Okay, from the wild type uh, receptor like you would say, okay? So, they extracted proteins, they loaded them on the gel, they ran a, an electric field, uh, whatever, and after they did the, like the method I told you before, that they this transfer and exposure to the antibody, but in the end, what's important is that you see here you have a length of sizes, and as you would expect, the top is the smallest uh, proteins that you expect to see, so they have a ladder, what normally you do, you run uh, a mixture of proteins that you know the size of, next, or, or specific like uh, colors that you know run, like you have a color that runs in 75 kilodalton and one that runs in 100 kilodalton, so you can compare uh, between the latter and your samples. And so they, they made two, two gels, or maybe expose the gel two times, it doesn't really matter, but in general, what they show is that if you put anti-NR1, and anti-NR1 means an antibody that is targeting NR1, okay? So what they get is that, let's look at the wild type in the beginning, they get a band that is in the right size of what they would expect, of that, what they would expect to detect NR1, and they say, okay, here we have NR1. <coughs> and the same thing about uh, NR2A, it's another antibody that targets specifically NR2A, and you see it's a different also size from this from this one. These two are different sizes. You can also see that this one is a little bit larger. And uh, <coughs> so they they managed to detect uh, also NR2A. What you need to ignore here in this article is the difference in the intensity of the band, just if there is a band or not. Normally in Western blood also the intensity it matters, but they don't talk about it at all, why there are differences uh, here but uh, we're going to ignore it. In general, we're going to say there is a band or there isn't a band. So, another thing that's very important is that they show uh, what, happens, uh, what happens if you just mutate one of the proteins, meaning that you have two mutations here and you don't have any mutation here. So you still get just one band, and if you do the other way around, just uh, mutate these two and don't mutate this one, then you have also the same uh, band. But interestingly, what happens when you have both mutants? Then what do, you, what do you see? You see this band. And what does this band mean? First of all, what, is it larger or smaller than the other bands? Like, 
it, it represents a larger protein, okay, because it's more up. It's in the range of the 300 kilo dalton, okay? So it represents a large protein. And what's interesting is that you see this band, even if you uh, put an antibody for NR2A, and even if you put an antibody for NR2, uh, uh, NR1, okay? In both of them, you can see it's in the same height. It's a little bit about, about 250, and this is a little bit about 250, uh, about 250. So if you have a protein that two antibodies detect in the same place, then it, it looks like it looks like they have this dimer that they wanted to, uh, they have this conjugation between the two proteins uh, which they wanted to show here, okay? Because I told you that normally these proteins are not, uh, these two are not connected covalently with one another, and especially if you put this protein mixture in a polyacrylamide denaturing gel, then you remember that the SDS like totally interferes with the structure and everything. So basically all bonds except uh, all bonds except the covalent bonds uh, just aren't relevant anymore. And only a, a protein that is, only something that is covalently linked, you will see like uh, in the gel, okay? Like it's what, what I define as the same molecule, okay? So this looks good. And what is the difference between, I, I actually don't expect you to know this, but uh, DTT and DTT, uh, what, do you know what DTT actually does? Did you try to read a little bit about it? So DTT is a reducing reagent. It actually breaks. It, it's very good at breaking specifically diesel feed bonds. Okay? So what they want to show here is that this demerization didn't just spontaneously occur because of non-specific interactions that may have occurred because of the introduction of the molecules, but it was specifically a disulfid bond um, that was linking these two proteins together. Because when they added the DTT that breaks this field bond, they have the same, they don't see this dimer anymore. Okay, they don't see this large protein connect to one another anymore. And they just see uh, the wild type, like, like the wild type, meaning that they, the two of them were separated. Okay? So this is actually a really elegant, nice uh, proof. This looks very easy, but it's a lot of work doing all these mutations specifically and stuff like that. Um, but they showed it really, this is very clean and very uh, relatively uh, nice. Then, actually, I don't, I don't understand exactly why they did this part. Part of it is probably like a reviewer's comment or something that wants to see like electrophysiology because the general question here is whether adding these amino acids, like adding this uh, diesel feed uh, bridges, like, what did it do to the, to the activity of the protein, okay? But in general, you think that, okay, they added this mutation, so maybe it disrupted the protein altogether, or stuff like that. And even if you break the diesel feed uh, bridges, then you still alter the amino acids in the protein, so it might affect the activity. So, in general, um, they address this, they address this uh, experiment, so, First of all, uh, what they did is that they <coughs> uh, what they did is that they activated um, uh, they they put a mixture of uh, glycine and glutamate to the solution, and then they got uh, and then they got like a, they, they put like a administration of uh, glutamate and, and glycine uh, along this uh, this line for a few seconds, and what they saw is that the channel was opening. Okay, and this. And this is normally how you show like a positive ion entering the cell. You will see as a negative or a down, a down or cur downward current. So this is the wild type, and you see. <coughs> and again, they want to show what happens when you put DD DTT and uh, no DTT. So you see that the DTT actually also changes uh, the permeability of the membrane of the not the membrane permeability of the channel, also. Uh, in the wild type, and they say because you know there are other cysteines in the protein, not only the cysteines that they uh, that they put here, and probably they cause some kind of conformational changes um, that also <coughs> uh, that also can alter the activity of the protein, okay, of the channel. But in general, also there you can see. Actually, I don't think we have time to really address this, but 
one important point that I want you to, to notice here, which is about scales in general, is that if you don't look at the scale and you look here, what, what, what is the image that you, that you see from here? You get, the, the, you get the idea that when you add DTT, all of these are the same, right? Everything here is the same. So I think that this is one of the things that they wanted to, like, to show because they're saying if you have DTT, then all the manipulations that we did are canceled and everything is returning to normal, okay? But it's actually not true because this, is an, because this scale is four times larger than this scale. Which, is, which means that this is like probably the size of this one and this is like a lot larger or this should be like something like this. So I don't want to dwell on this too much but in general they state this as, a, as a, another proof that this is, the actual, uh, this is the actual structure and it's still functional. Okay, the, the channel is still functional although I don't know why it's important for them to show that it's still functional because you change it. So it may be not functional. So who cares? Okay. So this sounds like a question that normally you get from a reviewer that is very petty and wants to uh, fail you. So <laughs> you will ask, do electrophysiology to show me that uh, this didn't change, and then they did. Okay. So and the last thing. So up until now they showed the crystallography. They showed that it's uh, similar to the NR2 uh, uh, receptor. And they, they proved that what they crystallized looks like the actual real live uh, uh, protein. So what now? What actually normally you'll find in nature papers, in papers that have high impact. What's next? What do, what do you want to show further? So yeah, you want to show now you have, the you have the structure, you have the crystallography, what can you learn from it, okay? So you proved that you, you did the crystallography right and everything is good. So now what, what, what does science gain from your discovery, okay? And this is this figure. <coughs> so again, we have the, com the comparison between um, the structure. Oh, here we don't see it. Why, is it. why does this look like this? Okay, I think that something went wrong here with the color. Okay, never mind. So anyway, uh, again you have a comparison between these two subunits and uh, uh, GLUR2, and this time GLUR2 ani, and we'll call it, this, this small ani is a molecule, it's actually also a synthetic molecule. Uh, what's special about it is that it's administered a lot of times as a drug to, over, to cause over excitatory effects in, uh, in cells and neurons, and this molecule specifically, they know, like uh, previous works have shown how this molecule binds, how this molecule binds to the GLUR2 receptor. And what it actually does, the effect on the GLUR2 receptor is that it slows down the deactivation of the, of the channel, of the, NR, of the GLUR2 uh, channel. So if you have this molecule, then the GLUR2 channel, um, the, the deactivation of the GLUR2 channel slows a lot more. Like the, the speed or the time scale lengthens, okay? So why speci specifically is this interesting? Because when they compared, and here it's very, very hard to see, but you, do you see this green thing here? Green loop here that points to the Y535? Uh, uh, five, three, uh, five, three, five. You see this? So what they show actually, this is where the, this molecule, the any molecule, binds to the uh, GLUR2 receptor and they show that one of the differences between the NMDA structure that they, uh, that they solved is that in the NMDA there is a molecule, that, what do we call an aromatic ring molecule, like a ring of carbons is an aromatic ring. So you have an intrinsic aromatic ring in this site. So they say, okay, so we know that there is a, so the GLUR2 and the NMDA uh, and these units of the NMDA are pretty much similar. And this amino acid that we have in the, this amino acid that we normally, uh, that we have in the NMDA receptor and we don't have in the GLUR2 receptor is interesting because it may, uh, may make the same effect as this drug is doing in the GLUR2 receptor. Okay? 
repeat it again. Is it clear? Because it's a, it's a pretty like subtle and complex uh, idea. They say we have this drug that it, we know what it does, and then we see that in the in the natural structure of the NMDA, you have something that looks like this truck, like this drug, that is intrinsic to the protein itself. Okay, so they hypothesize maybe this site is what causes the NMDA receptor to have the slow uh, kinetics and the slow activity. Because we know that when we add this drug, drug to the GLUR2 receptor, it slows it down. So what they actually did is that they took this tyrosine, you see that has this, uh, um, um, this aromatic ring, and they mutated the protein so it will have in this location, this specific location, different types of uh, different amino acids. And why, do, why did they choose this specific amino acid, all these amino acids? And you can see it from the structure. This one looks pretty much like this, but it's larger, and it's aromatic. This one looks almost exactly like this, but it doesn't have a carboxyl, <coughs> a hydroxyl uh, group over here. This one looks pretty much like this one, but it doesn't have the aromatic ring. Okay? So they, they mutated this, this position or this location to several different amino acids that are similar or unsimilar, like in specific, they, that have variations from this amino acid in very like subtle and unsubtle ways. So they want to know what is important uh, for this kinetics. And this is the last figure that uh, we're going to talk about. And what they actually showed here is like, maybe we'll just focus on, on these graphs. And in general, and also focus on three amino acids, what they showed is that if you, if you take the wild type, and this is a trace of the deactivation or the closing of the channel, okay? This shows how, how long it takes for the, for the memory potential to return like to normal when you, when you activate this channel or administer glutamate. And this is when you administer glycine. But well, the glycine is less, uh, less interesting, so we'll focus on the glutamate. And in general, what you can see is that when you mutate the, the tyrosine, when you, when you swap this amino acid uh, with serine or with, uh, uh, with leucine, then you get a much faster kinetics, okay? You get like, a, you see this is the wild tap and these are the two others. So the closing is much faster. So they say, okay, this is one of the proofs that means that this aromatic ring is important in order to stabilize the structure and keep it open uh, longer. And actually one of the nice, maybe not unexpected uh, results that they got is that when, they mute that when they mutated the tyrosine to amino acid that has even a larger um, aromatic group, it slowed the receptor even more, okay? Which they tried to explain by hand waving because it was not expected because if you have like a, if you're trying to fit a key to a, to a lock, if you use like a, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you, yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you use a larger molecule, you'll have like a, a different effect. So they try to hand wave and say this interacts with other things and stuff like that, and thus causing a more st stabilized structure. But in general, this is a really beautiful um, example of how the molecular structure, in general, how they, how they from knowing the exact in molecular structure, the atomic structure of this protein, they could actually see, understand more about mechanisms of like drugs in, in general, and try to, and also from uh, strictly from the structure, they can understand the mechanism by which this receptor uh, is deactivated in a slow manner relative to other uh, to other channels that deactivate a lot faster. Okay, and they propose and. Almost always in nature articles, you have a model in the end that shows like the main finding or the main, so apart from the crystallography, which is obvious they showed it before, they now show this, you see this aromatic ring over here that they say that once glycine and glutamate are binding, it actually stabilizes the open conformation of the channel and thus leaving the channel open to longer periods of time than non-NMDA non -MDA channels, okay? So, in general, I would just like to say that this, this article also shows you like 
very distinct approaches. You can like uh, look. You can look at memory. Uh, some people look at this article and say this is a very important article for memory formation and for you know cognitive functions in general because you can understand the basic the basic me mechanism that underlies this. And also you can understand something about the kinetics, which is like the kinetics of this channel is obviously very important for even network activity of the of the neurons together. So the most uh, you know extreme uh, theoreticians that don't like to talk about biology a lot of times they say I don't care about that the, that the neuron is a cell or that it has proteins that's not where information is like information is in the network is in the steady states of the network and the dynamics of the network but as you can see here these properties actually determine the dynamics of the network okay so it's uh, like one of the things that we're trying to, I think, to teach in this center in general is to show like, that you can attack the question of memory and, and memory formation and LTP from different, uh, from different, completely different angles, okay? <laughs> no, wait, I'm not done. I didn't get to the, I didn't get to the interesting uh, things yet. Okay, so I probably won't have time to finish the next chapter, but it's okay. Um, so, you can, uh, like I told you, some, I said to some of you, you can, if you read, if you try to go over the article one more time now, uh, it will probably be easier to, to understand it, okay? And if you have general questions, then uh, you're welcome to, uh, to ask. So, we're not going to go over everything that is in this chapter, just why did I open it like this? Over everything in this chapter, just on the very, very basic uh, uh, DNA and RNA structure and translation, uh, transcription and translation. And I understand that you learned some of it from. Uh, uh yeah, I'm not sure if you went to the general. You talked about the genetic code and stuff like that, right? A little bit. Okay, so it's, it's okay. I'm sure that you will not suffer from the rehearsal uh, on that. So generally, when we're talking about a uh, structure of nucleic acid, we, s we first need to say something about a concept that's called the central dogma. Okay, the central dogma in biology, if someone, uh, if you ever hear this term, means that you have the DNA due to process transcription is, trans is uh, converted to RNA, and then this RNA is translated to protein, okay? And this is like the basic dogma of molecular biology. And obviously, obviously the story is much more complicated than this, okay? But in general, it's very, very important to know like uh, this basic, pro uh, this basic uh, process. And generally, uh, so DNA, the, the, the rows, if you, if you say of nucleic acid in general, DNA and mRNA are, are in charge of information storage or information transfer. Um, tRNA is a special kind of, uh, of RNA. Did you learn about DNA? No? So it's a special kind of RNA um, that actually interprets, it's in charge of this translation between the RNA and the protein. Okay? And, <coughs> and the, third, the third type of like the most uh, common role of a nucleotide and nucleic acid or RNA is, R, is what we call rRNA. RNA is RNA that forms the ribosome. The ribosome is like the machinery that uh, does this translation from RNA to proteins. And to today we know that RNA has a lot more uh, roles apart from, apart from these three uh, classic roles, which is regulation of expression of genes and can even have like catalytic activity. Some, uh, like you said, like ribosomes, <coughs> and other RNA mo molecules can really uh, catalyze certain reactions, okay? And actually, one of the hypotheses is that before we had proteins, you had RNA, like in the evolution, uh, uh, evolutionary way. So, in all these, the category of these, uh, all these RNAs are defined as non-coding RNAs. When I say coding, I mean that it's, co it's coding for a protein, okay? So it doesn't mean that you can't have genes here, yeah? This is a gene, this is a gene, and all these that have a function are a gene. But this is non-coding RNA, and here, 
the mRNA is the only is the only sort the only type of RNA which is what we define as coding. But, but, yeah, but the DNA also has information about specific RNAs that are not coding into proteins in the end. Not coding means that they only do the work of translation? No, they only do their work in an RNA form. They don't translate to proteins ever. For example, the RNA, the ribosome, is built mostly of, of RNA, okay? And this, and this gene, or the, the gene that, that codes for the units of the ribosome, it never translates to protein. The activity is in its RNA form. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's one of the reasons that they think that RNA is more ancient, like uh, in that sense. It's another concept that the uh, neurobiologists are uh, having trouble with. I'm battling with this, uh, like thinking about RNA as something that has activity, which, is, but it's funny to think that you, I have to. Uh, um, like convince people of that because you have the 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 most common enzyme and most like by far the most common enzyme in the body is the ribosome, okay? And that and that enzyme is made of RNA, okay? So it's not very difficult to conceive that there are other RNAs that also act as as enzymes, okay? And also have other functions. So we'll not dwell on this now because we're talking about it later. General, generally, this is like a general scheme of a cell, how a normal cell looks like, and it has an eukaryotic cell, which we'll, we will talk about mostly, has a nucleus, and in the nucleus there's also a structure called a nucleolus. This is not membrane embed, uh, embedded structure. It doesn't have a membrane surrounded it, surrounding it. It's just a location inside the nucleus where specifically RNA genes are and there are <coughs> where they are transcribed, um, where like the ribosome is built, not not completely built, but the subunits are built and then it assembles uh, outside the nucleus. And generally, this whole thing here is filled with DNA. Okay, I know that normally you think about uh, chromosomes, you learn about chromosomes, you see this and you see this structure that looks like this, right? like these things, but normally our chromosomes or our DNA is not organized in this way. Just when the cell is uh, replicated, oh, sorry. just when the cell is replicated, it's in the form uh, that looks like this, okay? But normally, uh, all of our non-replicating cells in the body, they have a DNA that's filling this nucleus. It's completely filling this whole space, okay? But it's still in chromosome? It's still in chromosome. Chromosome is defined as we have 20, 23 pairs of, of chromosomes, humans, and that means two copies of each, uh, of each chromosome, and the chromosome is just defined as a long molecule, okay, that's a long molecule of DNA. So uh, we have these 23 pairs of long molecules that have it, uh, inside them genes. And just when the cell is uh, getting ready to replicate, do these huge structures condense and form these formations that you see Normally when you type homosome, you'll see this. But they're still called homosome, even if they're spread out uh, throughout the, the nucleus. Okay? So generally, this process of transcription happens in the nucleus, uh, the transcription to, from DNA to RNA. Then the uh, pre-mRNA goes through a series of splicing and editing, which is very uh, important. And then, after this processing, it exits the, <coughs> the nucleus through special pores, where it meets um, ribosomes and gets translated. This is like the very the most simple uh, representation. And with the exception, DNA is generally what we call like the genetic material, with the exception for viruses that sometimes have RNA as their genetic material. They don't have DNA, just RNA. Okay. So, how do nucleic acid, how does the DNA uh, strand look like? So in general, like in proteins, like, like I said, that you have the N-terminal and the C-terminal, also DNA molecules or RNA molecules have directionality, okay? And normally what we refer to is, that if you see like a sequence of letters, like A, T, 
GC. The, con the convention is that this side is the five prime side and this side is the three prime. This uh, three prime side, unless it's uh, written explicitly that it's the other way around. And what they mean by the three prime and the five prime is that this end is where the five prime carbon of the ribose is, and this end, <coughs> uh, the the connection to the to the rest of the chain will happen through this uh, carbon, the three prime carbon. Okay, so remember when you're talking about uh, saccharides and sugars that their carbons are arranged uh, in a specific type of uh, uh, nomenclature or uh, we address them as numbers. So the five prime carbon is, uh, if you look at the DNA chain uh, as, it, as in here, then the five prime is the five, pr the five prime carbon <coughs> indicates the five prime end. And if, if you want to attach another uh, base, then it will, be, it will attach here and the attachment location will be through the three prime. Okay? So it's from five to three. Question? Okay, so in general we see um, here we, you don't, uh, we have instead of uh, showing you the base itself, it's just uh, written as C and A and G. So we, you remember we have four types of uh, uh, bases in DNA. And we also have four types of bases in RNA. But the only difference between RNA and DNA is that the T in DNA is converted as U in RNA. Okay. In general, this is how DNA looks like. If you if you try to look at the real life, uh, how how this molecule looks like, it's organized in what we call a, <coughs> a double helix. And this helix also has a very unique structure, in which bec because of this. Uh, uh, this double-stranded uh, formation that you have two two molecules that are one in front of another and then they're twisted. So you have areas where you have major groove, meaning that uh, um, the inside, as you say, of the helix is exposed, and you have areas uh, which you, where you have like minor grooves. Okay. So this is like the general structure, and here you can see a molecular representation of uh, the binding of the bases themselves. So this is the backbone. I would say this is the DNA backbone. And these are the bases that uh, connect with each other. And what are, the, what are the bonds that we have here? What type? Hydrogen. Right. These are hydrogen bonds. And in general, now we can see that this type of connection between G and C is much stronger thermodynamically than this bond here, than the, the, the bonding between these, because you have two hydrogen bonds as opposed to three hydrogen bonds here. Okay, so blah blah blah. One thing that is very important is that uh, normally when you talk about the discovery, that the first ones who discovered the DNA uh, structure actually did it uh, through crystallography, and the ones who took the credit for the discovery are uh, Watson and Crick, and they actually got uh, like a Nobel Prize and famous and stuff like that, but they didn't actually do the work. The one who did the work is Rosalind uh, L.C. Franklin. And um, she did. I didn't say they stole the idea. I said they, they took the credit for it. Okay, the idea for the, the interpretation, idea for the interpretation of the actual, the interpretation of the actual structure was done by them, but the actual, apparently, the, the actual experiment with the images were done by, uh, and like I told you, one of the major challenges in crystallography in general is to form your crystal. Okay, like later to interpret and stuff like that, today you have software that do it in general. Um, no. You're right. They have. They deserve credit. The only. The only problem. The only problem was that in their article they didn't even mention, not uh, Rosamond. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's why I like to show like. Yeah. That's one of the reasons that I like to show like when I show this 
in general. I show like her image is a little bit above them. See? <laughs> and also and also she's larger and they're smaller. Yeah, that's for sure. Okay. So um continuing on the structure, it has what you would call an anti parallel uh, confirmation, meaning that if we this is the five prime end of one strand, it will be in front of the three prime end of the second strand. So it's like an anti parallel. You remember that we talked about I'm uh, not talking about beta sheets but it's not related at all, but we just said that there's a parallel and an anti parallel. Okay? So this is an anti parallel uh, uh, configuration and you don't have uh, you don't have the other way around, okay? You can only have it in this form, in the anti-parallel form. Um, hydrogen and van der Waals. So, like you said before, hydrogen bonds are the ones that are holding the backbone, but in general, the, the formation of these headaches or the folding of the, of the two strands together are mostly held by van der Waals interaction between, uh, between the backbones. Okay, this is like the major form, which is called like BDNA. This is also what the Rosalind Franklin uh, crystallized. And um, this is all the, all the, almost all the DNA in our body looks in this form. But you can also have different structures of DNA, and uh, part of them are due to like the identity. Like let's say ZDNA, a lot of time occurs when you have a lot of GC uh, together. Then you have uh, this structure, but normally it just it's very rare. So I don't want to dwell on it. Uh, too much, but in general you have 3.6 amino acids, 3.6, no, 3.6, 10, no, we have, we have like 11, I think, is it written, ah, it's written, okay, so it's about 10.5 base pair per one term of the, of this helix, okay, and, uh, and the size of uh, uh, each one is like 36, 3.6 nanometers per term. Um, you're talking about the alpha helix, yes. like the the protein alpha helix. Yes. So it's different from this one. This is a double helix. The alpha helix is a, like a single. It's from a single backbone. So okay. It's the same, uh, it's it depends, but uh, more or less. Um, I don't know. Actually, I don't know if the alpha helix DNA tends to be larger uh, than I think. The same, this is like this size is 3.6 nanometers. I think that protein in general, like the whole length, the whole size of the, of the turn is like 3.6 nanometers maybe. But also it probably depends on the side chain. We can check it, but in general there is a misconception. Most of the times in articles and, uh, and, uh, and uh, books, you see proteins as much larger than DNA, but DNA is, is actually a huge molecule. It's not. Uh, on, and also RNA is large. So, um, like I said before, like, like you had in the questions of the previous chapter, this is one example of a protein that can bind to a specific structure like uh, of DNA and it binds through the major groove here. And actually what it does, it folds the strand of the DNA. Like it, it, it causes the folding, like this loop uh, of the DNA to, to fold. And this actually has a, a lot of uh, functions <coughs> in regard to protein, uh, um, to the transcription of specific uh, genes. Like a lot of time in front of genes, you'll have these data box binding domains or specific sequences that this data box protein, binding protein, knows how to uh, bind to. The reason it's called data box is that it has a lot of TA, 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 okay, in the sequence. <coughs> And normally this is part of the, what, what I'll show you in the, in the movie in a second, of the whole complex, if you remember the, the example of the um, Power Rangers. <laughs> so it's a complex of a lot of proteins that are working together, but are not covalently linked in this uh, amazing mechanism that actually causes the gene to be uh, transcribed from DNA to RNA. In general, like... What? So the protein itself doesn't have any TATA. It binds to a motif 
of DNA to a specific DNA sequence that has a lot of TATA. Okay? It has binding sites that know specifically how to bind to sequences that have, have these motifs. Okay, so the neural structure of DNA in the cell, um, this, this is more or less a good representation, but the fact that you have DNA that's just filling the whole nucleus doesn't mean that it's like open. It's actually really, really condensed. Most of, most of the DNA is uh, condensed in the form of, uh, <coughs> of chromatin molecules, um, like uh, molecules that, that you, have, you have specific uh, um, proteins that, that, can, uh, that can cause like, these uh, DNA strands to be more condensed. And <coughs> this is generally like just a representation of how you'll find um, the chromatin inside uh, inside the nucleus. One very uh, one amazing uh, fact is that if you take the all the DNA from a single cell, okay, and you put it together, then you reach a length of 1.8 meters. Okay, so we have we have a lot of DNA. Okay, and generally. If all the cells in the human body, you can uh, make like a, a fiber that can reach the moon or something like that. In general, it's like a huge, uh, you can think about it, it's a, it's a huge molecule. Okay, so I'll talk a little, bit, a little bit about the basic concept of the gene. Did you talk about this uh, in the previous class? No. So it's important to understand the general context. Like, let's say we have a like I showed you before, we have chromatin. We have we have our uh, DNA inside the inside the nucleus, and it's like winded and stuff. So, what are actually genes? In genes, you will not find like this something special. It's just a DNA. It's a DNA sequence. But normally, a gene has a specific type uh, has specific types of sequences, and these are sequences. They don't don't think that they're like something special. All of these are sequences that specific enzymes know how to bind to and know how to recognize in order to understand that this part from here to here now needs to be transcribed into mRNA. Okay? So somewhere along, uh, if you have a long, uh, a long uh, molecule of DNA, then you'll have genes organized on it in specific locations. And also it's important to understand that because because of directionality, the information is only uh, relevant in specific direction. And because we have two strands in the DNA, you can have, you can have like, and these are the two strands, you can have one gene. Normally it's depicted like something like this. So you can have one gene here, and you can have the second gene, a, a totally different gene here. Okay? Because you have because if you read it in the other way around, it means a completely different sequence. Okay? And these genes don't have to be related to one another, they don't have to be translated together, they don't have to uh, transcribe together. So how does the other know what's the direction? Because the recognition of elements is only specific to the strand. So let's say if we define like a promoter, re promoter region, then we will say that the promoter region for this gene is somewhere here, okay? Somewhere, as we will define, upstream, okay? Because always the direction that we say is from five to three, so the promoter region will be upstream of the gene, of the, uh, <coughs> yeah, will be upstream of the gene, and the promoter for this gene will be somewhere here, okay? So, what actually happens in this transcription uh, uh, process? If we try to, so that the idea in transcription, it's a lot of time confusing between transcription and translation, but transcription is the conversion from DNA to RNA. So <coughs> we have the, we can divide it into uh, three or four steps. The first step is the initiation part where RNA polymerase uh, can bind to a specific uh, location, which is a, normally we would define this location as a promoter. Okay, 
then this is a very simplified form. I will show a la later a video that shows it in like more detail. And also, it doesn't show all the proteins that are involved in all these recognition uh, mechanisms. But in, yeah. Can you explain what is a promoter? So promoter is just a sequence of DNA. It's a, it's a. Because it, it's a specific sequence that specific DNA, uh, specific uh, our DNA binding proteins know how to recognize and bind to. And because these proteins bind, they, they recruit other proteins that will now transcribe um, from, not from the promoter actually, normally it's like from a few base pairs downstream, they will start transcribing the protein, uh, the, sorry, the mRNA from the DNA. Okay, but it's just like a, you can say it's like a recognition sequence of the gene. And also, you have a lot of types of promoters in the cell, in, in the cell, and you have different, um, different DNA binding proteins that know, to, uh, know how to identify different promoters. Okay? But generally, it's very confusing, but it's just a DNA sequence. Okay? So we have the promoter region where the RNA polymerase will bind to, and then a polymer has created this uh, uh, looseness area. It like unwinds, uh, unwinds the two strands of the DNA and uses one strand uh, <coughs> and just transcribes the RNA on the basis of one of the DNA strands. Okay? And the other one, it doesn't, the other strand doesn't really matter. Like I told you, like here, uh, the other strand is just like hanging loose while it transcribes. <coughs> Um, the mRNA molecule on the basis of one of the strands. So this is the, like the last step, the, not the last step, the second step of the transcription is elongation, meaning that the, M the RNA polymerase starts running along the, the DNA strand, unwinding and adding bases here to form the nascent uh, RNA, and as you can see also, the first uh, the first part of the molecule that comes out is the five prime, so it's always five to three. Five is the first, three uh, is the last, uh, is the end of the molecule. And in the end, there's a termination. Normally, again, there are a lot of factors that are formed that are joined together uh, in order to terminate uh, uh, terminate the transcription. And the RNA polymerase falls off the strand, and you have your completed RNA strand. Okay, so we'll just see a movie summarizing this. The central dogma of molecular biology. Why is it so weak? DN RNA makes protein. Here the process begins. You can't hear nothing, right? Transcription factors. <laughs> Wait. Why is it so weak? It's so irritating. Assemble at a The central dogma of molecular biology, DNA makes RNA, makes protein. Here the process begins. Transcription factors assemble at a specific promoter region along the DNA. The length of DNA following the promoter is a gene, and it contains the recipe for a protein. So you see this area over here? It's just uh, like the promoter region where specific factors know how to bind in the beginning. A mediator protein complex arrives carrying the enzyme RNA polymerase. It maneuvers the RNA polymerase into place. You see, this is the megazord. Okay. Inserting it with the help of other factors between the strands of the DNA double helix. The assembled collection of all these factors is referred to as the transcription initiation complex. And now it is ready to be activated. 
Yeah. The initiation really accurate. complex requires contact with activator it's proteins, in which bind time. to specific sequences of DNA known as enhancer regions. These regions may be thousands of base pairs distant from the start of the gene. Contact between the activator proteins and the initiation complex releases the copying mechanism. That's also what I like about these videos. You see these things floating around? So these are, there are a lot of nucleotides, okay, because you need to have these building blocks in order to, to build uh, the RNA molecules. So they're actually very, very concentrated. Like in the, in the cell, there are a lot. In the nucleus, you have a lot of nucleotides just floating around. And the energy actually comes from the breaking of the nucleotides because they're nucleotide, they're triphosphate. So the breaking of the phosphate actually is the energy for the running of the RNA polymerase. The RNA polymerase unzips a small portion of the DNA helix, exposing the bases on each strand. Only one of the strands is copied. It acts as a template for the synthesis of an RNA molecule, which is assembled one subunit at a time by matching the DNA letter code on the template strand. The subunits can be seen here entering the enzyme through its intake hole, and they are joined together to form the long messenger RNA chain snaking out of the top. Yeah. So this is like a real life representation, and also the, I like about this video is that they, the time scales are correct. Okay, so this is actually what happens. Um, like more or less, right? So you have uh, you have faster ones and you have smaller ones, and you also have different types of RNA polymerase. For example, for RNA, for the RNA that you need to to make protein to make uh, ribosomes, you have a, a a separate kind of uh, RNA polymerase than from for genes, for long genes, for genes that will later code for uh, proteins. Okay, so uh, that's it. This time you will not have, I think because we didn't finish this chapter, then you won't have any questions, uh, you won't have any questions to answer in our article. So we have a free, 